everybody. Glad to be with you tonight. Uh, we, this is December 1st, and in December, we're starting a period of time when it is the best time to take pictures of birds in Northeast Florida. Uh, from about December through April, we have an abundance of birds in this area because Northeast Florida is a major flyway where the birds are migrating from north to south. And I'm not talking about Canadian snowbirds. I am talking about regular birds. Some of those birds continue down into Central and South America, but many of them stay in Northeast Florida uh, to build their nests and to lay their eggs and to raise their families. So we thought that tonight would be a great time to have a few of our members who actually do a lot of bird photography to share their favorite places for shooting birds so that you might get some ideas of places that you might like to go to shoot birds. My favorite place to shoot birds in Northeast Florida is called Vieira Wetlands. And you can see from this picture why I really, really like this, uh, this area. It is quite beautiful and it has a variety of landscapes in Vieira Wetlands and even a larger variety of birds. When I took this picture a couple of years ago and I was editing it, I tried to count all the different birds that are actually in the picture. And when it got over a dozen, I just stopped. There may be uh, from 10 to 20 different varieties of birds in this picture alone. So let me tell you about Vieira Wetlands. Vieira Wetlands is actually the furthest away from Jacksonville of all the places that we're going to share tonight. So we're starting with the longest trip it is 167 miles south of Jacksonville, but the good news is it's straight down I-95. Once you get to exit 191, which is Vieira, uh, you're only a couple of miles from the wetlands themselves. They're about two miles west of I-95. The drive takes about two and a half hours, so it's definitely doable to go down and take pictures and then come back in a single day or the way I like to do it is to go down in the afternoon and take pictures maybe at Black Point Drive and then spend the night and get up early the next morning and hit Vieira at sunrise. It's a great two-day excursion or a good one-day excursion. But why would you want to take a drive when we have birds right around here? Well, one of the main reasons is the birds are highly accessible in Vieira wetlands. And I'm gonna show you a map and show you what I mean. Also, there is an extensive variety of birds in Vieira wetlands. But lastly, and this is my favorite, it's just the sheer beauty of the area that makes it a great place for photography. So what is Vieira wetlands? Well, Vieira Wetlands is actually owned by Brevard County and it's part of their water reuse system. It was built in 1998. Uh, you actually pass the uh, water processing plant on your way into the parking for Vieira Wetlands. Vieira Wetlands covers about 200 acres and there's four different cells of land around a central lake. Each one of these cells are different because the water level in each one of the cells are different. And because of the differing water levels, uh, you will see different types of plants and trees in the different cells. And because of that, they actually attract different types of wildlife and different types of birds to the different cells. But one thing that's in common of all four cells, they all have birds and they all have alligators. So you do have to watch for the alligators. The Vera Wetlands, you can access it both by walking or in your vehicle for most of the time. The pink uh, lines that you see in the map is actually where you can drive as well as around the central lake. You can drive around the central lake. The um, reason sometimes that you cannot drive on the roads is if we've had a lots of rain. Uh, when there's uh, lots of rain in the area, they close the roads because um, when you drive on them, they can develop potholes and they got tired of filling all the potholes. So instead of doing that, they close the roads until the roads have dried again 
and then they'll be accessible to cars. However, they're always accessible to walking and to bicycles. If you, are, if you do go to the area wetlands and as you're driving around the roads, it's very easy to forget when you see these gorgeous birds landing beside you and just stop in the center of the road to take your pictures. But if you don't mind to be kind to the other photographers that are following along behind you, always remember to pull over from the road, uh, pull over safely and then stop and get out of your car to take pictures. If you want to find out whether or not there is, uh, the roads are open, they have a hotline that is staffed by volunteers. The whole park is staffed by volunteers. And that's the telephone number of the hotline. And you can call that and you'll hear a recording about whether or not the air wetlands is open to vehicular travel. And if you ever hear the name Rich Grissom Memorial Wetlands, that is the, the official name of the wetlands. Rich Grissom was a long-term employee of Brevard County and the wetlands are named after him. So what are the best months to go? Uh, the best months to go are right now, starting in December and through April, when there's many birds there and there's also many birds nesting there. As you can see in the top right-hand corner, uh, there are quite a few uh, great blue heron nests and these nests tend to be right by the road. And so you can pull your car over and get out your tripod and set it up and you'll be in good company with other photographers. And you can watch the birds coming in and out to the nest, both building the nest or later on uh, bringing food to the um, young birds after they've hatched. What is the best time to go? Well, just like any other photography, the light is best in the morning and in the late afternoon. Uh, the park is actually open from dawn to dusk. And if you're lucky enough to be there uh, on an overcast day, you can photograph beautifully all throughout the day. Or if you're doing like uh, Susan Hitches and doing infrared photography, you can photograph throughout the day as well and get great shots. Both of these pictures you see here were taken um, in a um, BPC outing that we had down to the era several years back. It just happened to coincide with the full moon rising and setting. And I got the uh, full moon rising uh, on the first night. And then the next morning, we had this beautiful, beautiful um, fog in the area, mist in the area, which made for absolutely gorgeous shots. One of the best parts about the air, the parts I like best, is that you can capture the birds as part of the landscape. These sand, sand, hill, sand hill cranes, say that three times, these sand hill cranes uh, were tending their nest in the middle of one of the cells when I was driving by in the car. And all I did was pull over, um, roll down my window, stick out my camera with its 500 millimeter lens on it, and um, rested on the edge of the window and take the picture of them tending their nest. I love pictures like this where you're not getting just the bird, but you're getting the bird in its environment. I like the fact that at Viera, you, uh, there is a lot of atmosphere so that you can really capture a mood in the picture. As you can see, this picture on the left is again uh, that at the BPC outing. Uh, this was when the moon was setting the next morning. And I was able to get a picture of this great blue heron standing on its nest just as the sunlight hit the picture. I love that picture and the colors that are in it and the fact that you can see the bird in its own environment. This bird and the birds in the bottom right hand corner is both an osprey and an anhinga that had been out uh, fishing and had come back and climbed up on top of these poles and uh, just as they're dead palm trees is what they are. And um, just as the light was setting, love the environment of uh, Vera wetlands and what you can see. There's a huge variety of birds. What you're seeing here is a limpkin, a great blue heron and an American bittern. 
uh, all three of these birds were captured on the same day at Vera Wetlands. Uh, in fact, we captured such a variety of birds on this day. Uh, we were about to leave and my um, fellow photographer said to me, you know, we've seen just about every bird. Uh, we've seen owls, we've seen uh, red-shouldered hawks, we've seen all the water birds. The only thing we haven't seen is a bald eagle. And within one minute, a bald eagle flew in front of the car. I swear to goodness this happened. <laughs> We stopped the car and got out and took pictures of the bald eagle. I asked my photo friend, you want to call on any other birds? And he said, no, I think I'm done for now. <coughs> so before I leave uh, the air and we go on to the other people to talk about their favorite places, uh, I wanted to share with you three tips that I ascribe to when I'm photographing birds. The first is I always feel like the most important aspect of bird photography, the technical aspect with your camera, is a high enough shutter speed to freeze the action. Some of these birds are darn fast and I always shoot with at least one one thousandth of a second and sometimes up to one two thousandth of a second in order to get a crisp, sharp bird particularly if you're doing a, a bird that's flying. To do that, I frequently will sacrifice the ISO and I'll go to a wide open aperture, such as the picture with the rosette spoonbill. So then I'm able to get that high shutter speed to freeze the bird and blur the, um, the scenery behind it. The third thing that I think is incredibly important when you're doing bird photography is to be um, very familiar with your continuous focus in your camera and also the tracking capabilities of your camera. Almost all cameras give you a choice between a single focus or continuous focus. And with bird photography, you really need to be using the continuous focus. And the tracking capabilities of the camera are incredibly impart, important if you are continuously focusing on a bird that is flying. So get yourself a camera that has good tracking capabilities and make sure that you know how to use them in order to really enjoy uh, bird photography. With that, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Jack Sevis. Uh, but please, uh, if you get a chance, uh, go down to Vieira and enjoy the environment there. Mr. Jack? Jack, have you unmuted yourself? No. Jack, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Jack, click the button in the bottom left hand corner where it says mute and unmute. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. If you haven't been to Sweetwater Wetlands, you're in for a big surprise. Because it's located in Gainesville, I usually pack my camera and I'm usually ready to go by 5 a.m. so that I can be there to catch the first light when the gates open. Upon arrival, 
you'll be required to place $5 cash into an envelope, so be sure you have the correct change. It's an honor system. Place your receipt on the dashboard of your car and park in one of the 40 parking spots. Now I'm gonna be giving you a lot of good information here, but if you're planning to go and you're looking for something else or more information, it's always good to go to their expansive web website. They give a lot of information about history and everything about the park. It's very similar to the park that, that Jean was just talking about. It has the different cells and, and they're raised and lowered at different times that allow for different birds to uh, take advantage of that. The entrance pavilion displays bulletin boards with sighting information, maps, and a closing time. It has fresh water and clean restrooms. Now, if you're planning to go there in the evening, pay close attention to that closing time because I understand if they have to come find you, there's a, there will be a fine involved. There are always friendly park rangers around to answer your questions and, and talk about different things that they have seen that you might want to go look at. Sweetwater Park is not only a place to connect with nature, it's a way to protect the environment. The park consists of more than 125 acres of wetlands and ponds. It's a biological process created to improve the water quality of Payne's Prairie, Alachua Sink, and the Florida Aquifer. It's a thriving habitat filled with vast numbers of plants and animals, including birds, butterflies, alligators, deer and wild horses. Now, I've seen the, the horse prints around on the roads, but I've never seen any of the horses there. Maybe if you go, you'll be lucky enough to see one. You can walk or jog in the 3.5 miles of crushed gravel trails, boardwalks and asphalt roads. Now I hear somebody groaning out there. Now, in my defense, the day I went there, these are the only two joggers that I saw and I wanted to get a picture of them. So that's the, that's the story I'm sticking with. You can experience the lush landscape from viewing platforms and learn about the habitat through educational signs and placards. They have a lot of these different pavilions around where you can sit down and get out of the sun, relax, can hook up with friends, good place to meet. You're gonna be able to take a lot of pictures there, but fishing, pets, and flying drones are not permitted. Park is open seven days a week, including holidays. Boba Links love the park. I've never seen one anywhere else. One of the things I really like about this park is you can get good shots with clean backgrounds. There's so many areas where you can walk where you can have the sun behind you. You're, you're walking around all the different cells. You can always find or position yourself to where you're getting really good light and really good backgrounds. Now I take a 300 millimeter lens and that's usually the only lens I ever carry. Uh, but I would say with this particular park, that's probably the, the minimum size that that you would want to have. There are lots of red-winged blackbirds out there. And this one, I really thought he was posing for me. I was really getting pretty close to him and he wasn't going to budge and he really started making some, some noises and I was getting some really neat pictures. Then I realized that I was standing right next to his nest. So I backed away. So you need to be cautious about that because a lot of times nests are very close to the boardwalks. Now, years ago, we used to travel all the way down south to Wakota Hatchie or Green Cay to find these little beauties. This is the purple gallinet and they're in, they're in Gainesville now. So it's great. The city of Gainesville Public Works and Gainesville Regional Utilities started this project in August of 2009 and finished the project in 2015. 
There are lots of juvenile birds, lots of nesting going on down there. This is the, a juvenile little blue. Now, if you like anhingas and cormorants, you might see one or two or 50. Recently, Florida apple snails started showing up and that brought the kites, the snail kites. This is a female snail kite searching for lunch. Here she is on a post with the with the lunch in her in her left talon, her right talon. Now, if you're lucky enough to see a male, this is, and I was lucky one time. I've been down there several times. Other friends of mine have been able to get pictures of, of the male snail kite, and I was there once and got this one shot, so I was pretty lucky. Walking around the boardwalks, if you're really patient, you look closely you're gonna see lots of different birds. The uh, American bittern, and my favorite, this least bittern, he might pop out and get a shot of them. They're really shy, so you, you have to be quiet and you, have to, and you have to really look for them. Again, like I said, you have to be patient. There are eagles, hawks, and ospreys all around the area. Birds in flight, there's so many birds around and ducks that they're always flying over. So it's a good opportunity to get pictures of or images of birds flying. A whole group of ibis were flying over and I took this shot and I kind of liked it. And of course, I don't think this guy was paying attention to the rules. So he was fishing and he caught this nice bass. And if you'll notice, the osprey will, will take the, the fish, his, his catch, and he'll position it parallel to his body. So he's aerodynamic. One of the other things I really like about this is you can get close up face shots. So many times that I've been there, a lot of these birds along the boardwalk will get up on the railing to the sun and dry out. And if there's not too many people around, you can get really, really close and get some really nice up close face shots. <clears throat> it's a female anhanga. Nighthawk, cattle egret, anhanga, another female. I don't think, I don't, I don't remember if this was the, the same one or not. It may have been, it may have been at the same time. great blue herring standing up on the railing. Now, if you're like me and you like warblers, there's plenty down there. And all around the wetlands, you're gonna see palm warblers like this one. You're gonna see one of my favorites, the common yellow-throated warbler or the pathonotary warbler. And one of the other things I like about it is around the wetlands, there are roads and there are lots of dry wooded areas where you're gonna see other types of birds, other warblers, like a prairie warbler. <clears throat> and I shot him right at the entrance gate where you come in and Northern Perulas and others. Now I usually go down, a lot of you know that I live in Maine during the, during the summertime. So I'm here from November to May and I go at all different times of the year. And mostly before April, there's mostly ducks and so forth down there. The best time to go really is April, May. At least that's what I have found. Right now, you're not gonna see any alligators, but if you go down in, in April or May, you're gonna see a lot of alligators and a lot of big alligators. So when you're walking on the trails and you want to get a little bit closer to a particular subject, you need to be really cautious if you're going to get down close to the water. Now these guys know enough that they, they stay up on the trail. These are Whistler ducks. A big gator was just cruising on by and that was, that was one of the bigger gators I've ever seen there. Again, in the winter, you're going to see Lots of different ducks. These are uh, bufflehead ducks. And again, you're gonna be able to walk around so you always have the sun at your back. 
because of all the different trails and all the different roads. So it gives you a great opportunity to get pictures and you're really gonna enjoy yourself. So if, if you're thinking about going, I would really recommend that you go to the website, check it out and plan your trip. And that's all I have. So I'd like to turn it over to Paul Card at this point. Paul? Hello. Uh, my presentation is on uh, Black Point Drive. Uh, it's kind of near and dear to me because I uh, was born and raised down there in uh, Bavard County. And uh, all this was not there when I left in 1975 or fixed up as it is now. Uh, it's part of the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, I'm not sure exactly, I guess I should have done a little more studying as to when uh, they started developing this and sharing this part as a wildlife refuge. Uh, it's well over 100,000 acres and uh, there's Black Point Drive and there's some other drives and trails uh, that you can, uh, you know, you can spend the day down there. You can spend two days down there. You know, you can go spend all day utilize the morning and evening sunlight and do it again the next day and not see it all. But uh, this is mainly gonna be about Black Point Drive and uh, you can uh, see a good bit of it real well uh, in a half a day. So uh, it is uh, again, about two to two and a half hours, depending upon what part of Jacksonville you're leaving from. Uh, you go down to the Titusville exit, uh, exit 220 and follow 406 East for about eight miles to cross the Max Brewer Bridge and the causeway to Merritt Island. Stay to the left after the bridge uh, where the road splits and continue on 406 and watch for the well-marked entrance on the left of Black Point Drive. Now what to see? There's breeding populations of brown a uh, bald eagles, brown pelican, roseate spoonbills, reddish egrets, modded ducks. There are spectacular migrations of many various birds, especially warblers, occurred during the spring and fall. Winter peak concentrations of waterfowl often exceed 100,000. Eight species of herons and egrets are commonly observed year round. Above is your, uh, your green herons. Uh, I did not know it till this last year, but right near the bathrooms on Black Point Drive, there is a huge nesting area in the spring of these uh, green herons. Now you got your tricolor herons. They're, they're pretty much present year round. I have seen them down there and uh, they're pretty, uh, pretty interesting. They're one of, one of my more favorite herons to watch. There's a huge white pelican uh, migration down there. Uh, it's a little early yet, but I was down there this past Saturday and I saw probably 50 or 60, but I was going to have to get wet uh, to wander out to where they were. And uh, they're there. And I've seen uh, where other photographers have uh, been lucky to get close to them already this year. Uh, they swim in the, the tidal pools around there. And if you can get there early in the morning, you can get good reflection shots there. This was one of the first trips I took down there. It was like, just as I pulled in there, all these birds went up in the air and uh, I was amazed. Uh, I guess I took that about 2015, I guess it was. Black Point Drive's a seven and a half mile uh, auto tour. The most popular wildlife viewing area is in the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Don't forget to look up in the trees and along the banks too. Birds, the birds roost above and pick through the grasses below or stand in preen. Even without a stop for, without stops for hiking, 
a birding expedition can take half the day at a slow pace. Uh, make sure you bring a good camera. Uh, a minimum lens you would want to bring would be a 300 millimeter, uh, uh, 600 millimeter with a one and a quarter can be real helpful at times when they are out there, but you know, a 150 to 600 or 100 to 400 is adequate. There's various raptors and plenty of uh, uh, various raptor species are plentiful at certain times of the year. October through April are typically the best times. The eagles right now are uh, mating up. Uh, I was down there Saturday and within an hour I had seen two sets of uh, uh, mating e uh, mated up eagles just sitting in the trees watching the traffic go by. Uh, these these here were kind of off the beaten path. I was not uh, on Black Point when I took this. It was uh, as I was coming in from the Hallover uh, Canal, which is uh, close by. The raptors are everywhere and beautiful to watch as they hunt. Ospreys. This here was up near Hallover. It was a accessible nest. Uh, I took this from a good ways away and then I cropped it in, but he's got a, uh, looks like a catfish. Uh, there's a juvenile, uh, less than a year old up there. That's, uh, I guess he's, uh, he or she's uh, getting ready to uh, share with. The best place to see wildlife is along the Black Point Wildlife Drive. The, the seven mile one way drive follows the dike roads around the several shallow marsh impoundments and through the pine flatwoods. This provides an excellent place to see waterfowl, in season wading birds, shorebirds and raptors, alligators, there's otters and bobcats, various other species of snakes and other wildlife may be visible as well. A self-guided brochure is available near the drive entrance. It will provide information on things to look for. Drive time is approximately 40 minutes. That's if you just drive through it and kind of sightsee. Uh, the restrooms are provided at the Crookshank Crook Trail Stop. There's the Rosette Spoonbills. There's, uh, as uh, you get into uh, January, February, they're very abundant and very beautiful with their uh, breeding colors. Uh, they fly in. You, if you're really into birds and flight, you, you really have to be prepared uh, for them as well as, as other uh, species that are flying around you. Uh, there's a bunch of these little guys, uh, pie-billed grebes and the reddish egrets can really put on a show. I, I, I went down, it's a little early in the year this past weekend. And um, I don't know, I probably shot a hundred shots and I was pretty much ready by 10 o'clock to wrap it up and ride back to Jacksonville. I, I typically get down there just as the sun's coming up. And uh, when I was making my uh, pass back through, uh, I got hung in on one of these uh, reddish egrets and I took another 400 shots just watching watching them put on a show the way they dance around in the water trying to catch fish. They had uh, to the right, so American Avocet. Uh, you see them early on in the drive and to the left is the black neck still. There's several ponds that you can see a variety of birds. Uh, the, the first few miles, the uh, I guess I can move this out of the way and I can read things. The first few miles are through shallow impoundments where depending on the water conditions, the flats may be dry and muddy with ponds or sheets of water. When the one water ponds, when the water ponds, the birds and the alligators gathers in tight clusters. And there are alligators. And again, you know, you get out of your car if you pull off the side of the road, there's there's not a lot of room in places, so be careful you don't pull off into a pond. But uh, 
be careful as you uh, get down along the side of the road. Uh, Linda and I were there, I don't know, about two years ago, and we were sitting on the side of the road. And just as we got up and got in a truck right where we were sitting down on the side of the road, practically with our feet in the water, a monster about this size crawled out of the water. I don't know if he was watching us or just kind of showed up there. You can stop at the pull off between the marshes to spend time birding from your vehicle, but be sure to pull fully off the roads at the broader spot so people can get by. There's also a couple of locations and blinds, you know, man-made blinds where you can get out your car and wander down a trail to observation decks as long as, a, and as well as one long hike, the Cruikshank Trail. It's about four, about four or five miles long. Uh, black skimmers uh, in the spring are real active down there. There's plenty of uh, variety of ducks, mallards and blue winged teals and pintails and bufflehead ducks. Uh, I've seen a uh, uh, bunch of the northern shovelers are uh, down there as well. The Crewshank Trail is nearly five miles long and it's on a levee out to the Indian River Lagoon. So that's a, that's a pretty long hike out there and back. The last part of the trail is a long drive route paralleling a canal off to State Route 3. There, I say there's no established pull-offs, but there is plenty of room to park either side. I have seen bobcats, I've never been able to photograph one, and I've seen uh, the otters in this canal that runs along the side, as well as alligators and a variety of different birds. Uh, when to visit is this time of year from October through April. They're generally the best times of the year for birding. The best time of the day is uh, early morning and late afternoon. Uh, as you come in the gate, there's a $10 fee now. I, I was just checking the website and it's not updated. The website says $5 per vehicle for the day pass. And you can purchase a yearly pass for $25 at the visitor center. Uh, they got duck stamps for hunters. America the Beautiful passes. Uh, I guess that would be like the uh, uh, National Park Pass. Canaveral National Seashore Passes may be substituted for the Refuge Pass. The Refuge Roads, Trails, and Boat Ramps are open from sunrise to sunset daily. And uh, if you're down there and you found you've done run out of Black Point Drive, there's real close by, uh, you got your, uh, the Hall Over Canal where they have the uh, 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 manatee viewing platform. We just walked up there one day. I didn't have a camera in hand, but Linda had hers and she snapped this picture of the, the mom and uh, calf. There's a scrub jay trail too and other surrounding areas near, such as the Hall Over Canal, which is real good for uh, ospreys. And I think that was it. I will hand it over to Moody. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so I've got uh, Huguenot Park right here in our back door. So we, uh, it's the closest spot I believe that we're talking about tonight. Um, and I've never been afraid of, of uh, being eaten there, uh, no alligators. Um, so it's on Hexer Drive. You do have to uh, cross the ferry to get there. Um, there's the address, phone number. Uh, it's five bucks to get in. Uh, I usually buy an annual pass. It's $95. It'll get you in there all year. That also gets you into Hannah Park. Uh, Hannah Park normally opens at 8. If you have an annual pass, you can get in at 6 o'clock. Uh, Huguenot used to uh, open at 8, but now they've, they've opened, uh, now they open at 6. 
All right, we've got a, here's a map of the park. Uh, you can see Hexer Drive there on the left-hand side. So if you get off the ferry and turn right, you just have to go 1.2 miles and you're right there at the entrance uh, of the park. You can see the little uh, gold square there. That's where you pay your $5. Um, you can also see that little bird observation area. You can bypass the main office, go into that area, and you don't have to, you can, you don't have to pay there. A lot of people go into that area and fish. I'll sometimes go into that area uh, and, and uh, photograph there. Uh, the center there, the idle zone, that is the bay side of the, what I call the bay side of the park. Um, so at low tide, uh, there are lots of sandbars there. Uh, you can wade, walk um, quite a bit of that area. Uh, the sandbars often are covered uh, with different birds resting, uh, eating. Um, so I use, I find um, low tide is a good time. I like to shoot the ospreys and uh, the low tide uh, kind of concentrates them and gives them, uh, I think it's easier fishing for them and easier for me to navigate and get around the area. Um, the um, east side of the park is the Atlantic Ocean and the south side there where it says Huguenot Memorial Park is that's the St. John's River. So the, the park is surrounded uh, on all sides by water. Um, um, Jean told me, you know, tell a little bit about the history. Um, so we know Jean Ribault from France uh, landed uh, in this area in uh, May 1st, 19, or, uh, 1562. Um, and he was uh, from France and he was a, a Huguenot. So that's how it got its name. But I thought that was kind of boring. So I, so I picked this up. Uh, this is a little story about Captain Ross. Uh, he was, uh, this is out of the paper in January 18th, 1926. This is his obituary. Uh, he built the uh, jetties there at the mouth of the river. Uh, Captain Ross was from Inverness, Scotland. He was born April 12th, 1840. He moved uh, to Wilmington, North Carolina in 1862. He got involved in the Civil War and he was uh, running uh, the federal blockade. He was taking cotton down to Havana, Nassau, trading that for supplies, bringing that down, bringing that back for, for the South. Um, he was a shipbuilder. Uh, he let, he moved to Jacksonville. came to, Came to Jacksonville in 1878 and and built the jetties. Um, he liked Jacksonville so much that he moved to the area. Brought his family down. He also built the jetties in Key West, Miami, uh, Charleston, Jack, and in Savannah. And when Mr. Flagler conceived the idea of running steamships to Nassau, uh, he built the first ocean pier in Palm Beach, Florida. Um, it goes on to say that uh, he was uh, married to Jeanette Hill. Uh, he was survived by her. Um, and then it mentions uh, his daughter and then his uh, granddaughter. Um, Mrs. P. Moody Clarkson, uh, who was from Jacksonville. So P. Moody Clarkson was my grandmother. So I believe that uh, Captain Ross was my great, great, uh, great grandfather. Um, so I thought that was a little more interesting than the, uh, <laughs> the French guy. All right. Um, some of my favorite things to see in Huguenot, there's tons of birds. Um, that's what I chase after most all the time uh, and bore you guys with on Facebook. You can also see uh, surf. There's usually surfers there um, most days. Um, you get lots of great sun sunrises. You can get landscape pictures. Uh, you can just get the uh, ships coming in and out of the river. And um, a lot of times you can see these uh, when you're in the park or when you're on the ferry.
um, some of the birds, uh, the best, best time to visit. Um, the nesting birds in May to August, uh, we have um, nesting birds. The main three birds that we have are the terns, uh, the pelicans, and the laughing gulls. And they're usually on the north end of the, um, of the park. They rope that area off. They shut it down uh, probably beginning in May. And I think that uh, stays closed to vehicular traffic until Labor Day. Uh, you, can, you can walk into that area so you can uh, get close to the nesting birds. Um, the other thing I like to do is chase after the ospreys and usually uh, the best time to see those are August, October. Uh, that's usually the time that the mullet are coming out of the river. And so there's tons and tons of bait fish. And so our osprey numbers will go up during that time of the year. Uh, this is uh, just going to run through some slides here, the different uh, birds that you can see. Um, oyster catchers, uh, there's not too many, but there seems to be a pair that um, stay there pretty much year round. Um, they, um, you know, I usually see their uh, chick each year. I don't know if they've ever been successful. I've always seen the chick. I've never seen it um, get much bigger than, uh, than it is right here. The, the uh, skimmers are there uh, actually during this time of year. Um, so you can catch them sometimes in the early morning um, if you're lucky enough to, to, to get them in the right light and uh, skimming along the water. Uh, this bird, uh, Eugenia calls this the moody bird. We both have the same type of uh, hairstyle. Uh, just, there's just a lot of different varieties of, of birds that you can see uh, there. So um, you're always uh, able to see uh, quite a bit and photograph different things. The uh, red, red egret that um, Paul was talking about, um, Sometimes we're lucky enough to see them and have them perform and dance and, sh and uh, put on a show for us. And there's always uh, different things that they're after, shrimp and fish. Uh, the wood storks, um, this is probably the best side of the wood stork covering up his face and got the nice light on those uh, feathers, normally those Feathers look black, but in the in the uh, light, they really light up. And the spoonbills there, um, we're starting to see them this time of year, so um, they're fu always fun to see. Um, you can drive on the beach. It's one of the only beaches that you can drive on. Uh, this guy thought uh, he didn't realize how deep the water was there and got stuck. Um, there's uh, surfing, there's always small waves, somebody out surfing. So sometimes they're good to photograph. When the waves are big um, at high tide, oftentimes they'll, um, you won't be able to drive out to the beach. That, the waves will just come right through that area that you drive through to get down to the beach. Uh, so this is a juvenile bald eagle. Um, it's pretty neat seeing them out there on the beach. Um, and another one just happened to pose uh, here on one of the, the posts there that day. So the pelicans. The pelicans um, are fun. They, uh, they nest. Unfortunately, they like to build their nests um, pretty far into the dunes, so they're a little bit uh, hard to photograph. Um, the longer lens you have, the better. Uh, it's fun to watch them um, build their nests. And I think <clears throat> their chicks are one of the ugliest chicks I've ever seen. They, to me, look like dinosaurs. When they're first born, uh, they don't have this beautiful uh, down on them. They're pretty just solid gray when they're first born. So they're, they're not very cute, but then they get that down on them and they uh, much nicer and better to look at. So I like to just do uh, portraits of these guys. 
it's pretty crowded there, lots of birds. So sometimes it's hard to find one that you can isolate. And it's pretty funny to imagine how these guys with those bills uh, collect uh, nesting material. And then, you know, do they break that off of those bills? Um, and then trying to navigate with it and fly with it. So this one I thought was pretty uh, amazing. You can see he's got it in his mouth, but then it also goes down behind him and underneath him. I don't know how he got off the ground with that big piece of nesting material. And this was just a panorama. I, you know, I shoot with the longer lens, so I just took several pictures and uh, stitched that together. And this guy has at least three fish in his mouth, so uh, sometimes you can, you know, get some action shots and uh, them doing different stuff. Um, the next, uh, the nesting bird is the tern, and I like to, they're fun to shoot. Um, it's a great place for bird, uh, getting birds in flight. Um, this guy's got a, a squid. You can tell the ink there on his chest, the black ink from the squid is on his chest there. Um, they also will catch, um, you know, small fish, uh, shrimp. So when you go down there to photograph and you see these guys, I mean, there are thousands of, of these uh, birds coming in um, to feed the chicks. And it can be kind of overwhelming, you know, if you're trying to photograph birds in flight, you know, you're just getting dizzy. You're standing there and these birds are circling and going all over. And um, so you don't know which way to point your camera. But if you, what I'll do oftentimes is just, you know, look in one direction. And you'll actually see, um, you know, like just one group of birds that will be coming in off the ocean. And if you go there, you, you'll just see them one after the other after the other, and you can get in that location. And it's easy to, um, you know, practice your bird for photography because the bird, you know, will just be coming in the same direction all the time instead of, you know, trying to get them going all, all the different directions. So this chick, I think, is probably about uh, three or four weeks of age. Uh, the birds uh, are born in the dunes, and they'll kind of stay there until they're, you know, about this big. And then the uh, parents will start bringing them to the edge of the dune. And eventually, uh, shortly there after this, they'll bring them out to the beach. This day, um, we had some white clouds in the background, uh, the bird up on the dune, so he was about eye level. So it was like having a little uh, turn bird studio there to photograph. And as others talked about, we, I use the low aperture. You can blur that background. I like to watch the behavior of the chicks and the other birds. I mean, that's what interests me most about doing uh, animal photography is the behavior. Um, and so this is the, you know, this is one behavior that I look for uh, when I'm photographing these chicks. So this chick is, um, you know, he's about to get fed. He sees his parents and that's what they'll do. They'll, they'll um, those wings will come up, their head will go up and then mom's gonna be coming pretty shortly thereafter. Again, this one's, um, that's doing the behavior that I'm looking for. And that's, that's the shot that I enjoy uh, trying to get the most. Um, so I, I, um, I enjoy trying to capture that action. And it takes about uh, just very short period of time for the mom to hand that to the chick and um, for them to swallow it. If he doesn't swallow that fish very quickly, the laughing gulls are going to uh, come in there and uh, steal that from them. So here's here's a uh, another one that's getting ready to be fed. And actually, when they th no, so this guy's out on the beach. Um, you know, mom's getting ready to to swoop in here. So I will watch the chicks. I've, I've tr took me a while to try to figure out how to to photograph these guys. 
uh, when I first tried to photograph, I would um, see the adult with the with the fish. I would try to focus on the adult and follow it, and then see if I could, you know, get it meeting up with the chick and get the handoff. But um, usually, the bird in in the air, I can follow, kind of maintain focus. But then when they drop down, you got the different background. I would usually lose focus by the time I regained focus. Um, I had already missed the shot. So I learned that I would um, just watch the chicks and watch their behavior. And um, when the chicks are about this age, oftentimes they're taking a nap on the beach. Uh, maybe they've had their breakfast. Um, and that sometimes the adult birds will come then peck that, peck that little guy and they'll jump up and they'll say, they'll say okay, I know that uh, breakfast is coming. So they jump up and they will uh, usually run, a, run away from the other birds, kind of get into an area by themselves. Um, and I think the adults fly up and down the beach um, to try to get that chick to get away and uh, be by themselves. So they, they can make that handoff successful. And so I focus on the chick. When I see this, I'll start uh, shooting um, pictures and then the adult will fly into the picture and then I'll capture uh, different poses. When I'm um, photographing the birds, I'm always concerned about the wind direction and the sun direction. As Jack mentioned, we try to get the sun over our shoulder. Um, and normally I like an east wind when I'm photographing, especially the osprey. Uh, because the birds will take off and land uh, in the in the direction of the wind. So, um, so for the osprey, the east wind is great. You've got the uh, the wind over your shoulder. The bird will be coming right at you. With the turns, uh, that doesn't work as well. Because if you got the east wind, mom's going to be coming at you, uh, and you'll have the chicks rear end. So actually, a north or south wind works better to photograph the turns. You know, normally the, the bird uh, mom will just hand that to the chick. For some reason, she decided to toss this one up in the air and uh, maybe teaching him how to hunt on his own, I guess, perhaps. So uh, this is a video that I took uh, just to try to give you an idea of the speed that this occurs. So I've got this uh, video, it repeats itself we're first going to see this in slow motion. So the chick is getting excited. He sees mom, the head goes down, the wings go up, and here comes mom. The handoff happens and the fish is gone. All right, so now we're going to see it in real time. All right, wings go up, boom, it's over with. So it, it happens in a blink of an eye. Um, so it's, a, it's a fun to photograph, but it happens pretty quickly. If you're not paying attention, it'll be over with. But, um, but it happens, you know, a million times. So there's there's uh, so many chicks on the beach. And I oftentimes wonder, um, you know, how many times a day do those chicks get fed? Three, four, five times a day? And then there's how many chicks are on the beach? And I wonder how many fish they pull out of the ocean if we put out all those fish together. I mean, you must have like several uh, semi trucks full of fish that those guys catch and get fed every, every year. All right, the next, my favorite bird to photograph uh, just simply for because of the action is the ospreys. Uh, I like to try to get them um, catching the fish. And um, it's fun to see them uh, hit the water and come up um, with the fish. They are not the greatest, uh, I don't know how, what the percentage they're successful. They're not the greatest uh, fishermen. They uh, miss quite a bit. Um, I've learned that when they hit the water, uh, if they come up quickly, they're going to come up empty handed. If it takes them a while to come up, they usually are readjusting and getting hold of that fish. 
So they're usually going to come up with a fish if they um, are taking a while to come out of the water. So this guy's coming right at us. Talons are out, heads in the front, and then kabam, um, he hits the water. Uh, it, you know, it just explodes. We've got fish flying everywhere. This is another one coming in. <clears throat> and I'll have to admit, um, so my talk is about Huguenot, but this is down the road at uh, Nassau Sound. And um, I was with Paul Card that day. Um, Paul has a pontoon boat and we were on his boat. And um, so Nassau Sound, there's plenty of ospreys there, but they're kind of hard to get to. You really need a boat to uh, to photograph them or get to the good spots. And, and Paul is now, you know, uh, guiding and stuff. So if you want to go out on a boat and try to photograph the osprey, you can uh, sign up a time and go with Paul, perhaps. All right, the other thing, you know, here's just a landscape shop, no birds that day. We had some clouds. I thought that was just kind of a cool shot. Um, this is on the, um, that bird observation area. That's a, where you can uh, not pay and just walk out. There's a little trail you can walk out to and get to the, get to that bay, bay part that I talked about. The sand dunes. Um, so sunrise, I try to get there early in the morning. Um, this day, um, I was on the ferry. I could see the sky turning orange. I uh, about crashed my truck trying to get my camera, parked the truck and get out. Um, this shot, we're looking at the river. So I ran down to the river. Um, you can see the jetties there in the right hand side. And just started shooting a few pictures as the sun came up. Uh, this shot, we're looking, we're on the bay side. We're looking over the dune towards the ocean. Uh, this morning, the blue heron happened to be sitting there. I was hoping I could get my camera and get a shot before he um, left the scene. Uh, this was uh, this summer uh, when we had that dust storm. Um, so we had that unusual kind of pur purple sky. And I believe Sean was with me on this day. I uh, took him out there. We we're hoping maybe to shoot some ospreys. Um, we've got no clouds to the north, no clouds to the south. But we've got a rainstorm and it's coming right at us. I think our day got cut short that, that morning. Uh, this was, um, I got a little bit early to the ferry. Uh, saw this sh uh, ship coming down the river. Uh, beautiful sunrise, so I went down to the uh, boat ramp there at Mayport and just parked, took some shots of the of the boat. And then um, Sean took this picture. We were out trying to shoot the uh, ospreys. Um, that's on that bay side, and that's about as deep as I try to get when I'm walking on those sandbars and stuff. I try to get as close to the, where the ospreys are fishing as possible. Um, and I believe that's the end. So I, um, let me get out of here. We're gonna turn it over to Bill McSherry. Um, he's our next speaker. He's gonna talk about the alligator farm. Indeed. Good evening, y'all. I'm going to speak to you about uh, the alligator farm as soon as I can share it here. Here we go. Um, I like to go to the alligator farm to shoot birds. I've mm -hmm. been going there. It suddenly occurred to me for about 10 years. I do go to some of these other locations that these folks have talked about. Um, alligator farm is still probably my favorite because of ease of access to the birds. By the way, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'll assume the answer is yes. Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, we can hear you. you. Very good. Um, and if I could get my screen to advance, life would be wonderful. 
There we go. So the alligator farm is located in St. Augustine. It's right on A1A, so that if you just drive south on A1A, uh, cross the uh, Bridge of Lions, not long after that, within about a mile or two, it's right there on your right side. Um, it's a private zoo that maintains alligators and many other kinds of species. The adult admission is $28. But if you have more than, you know, just a, a casual interest to shoot birds, you probably want to buy the annual photo pass, which is for $120. That's as much entry as you want. And during bird season, it includes early entry and late stay. Although during the year here with COVID-19, late stay was... Uh, they opened two hours earlier, but they canceled late stay because of the difficulties of needing to clean the park and so on at the end of the day. Um, most of what you're gonna get is southeastern shorebirds like we've seen in some of the other places. It's in a waiting rookery that they call the swamp, which is where there's plenty of alligators. Uh, so waiting rookery is where shorebirds nest and have their offspring. These birds aren't captive. They go there of their own accord. There are, there are captive birds elsewhere in the park, but the guys in the swamp are free. They come and they go. Uh, so the birds nest there, and this is interesting because the swamp is inhabited by alligators. And the reason they do that is the alligators will keep keep out the things that would prey on the bird's eggs, like raccoons, like, uh, you know, uh, squirrels, rats, the whole nine yards. Those don't go in there because, well, there's alligators. And that works pretty well most of the time for the birds. But just occasionally, uh, birds fall in, young and old, and uh, then the alligators kind of get uh, their piece of the action. Um, you know, you can like crank up the music from Jaws and just imagine what goes on at that point. Some people like to photograph that, I don't. When that happens, I just kind of walk away. The best time to go there basically is February. The season is, is February through June, or actually March through June. That's when they open early and let you stay late if you have a photo pass. Um, no, I got misspelling there, but in any event, some species like the wood storks and the great egrets arrive and start nesting a little bit earlier. So if you go down there and say late February, you won't be able to get in early, but you'll start to see them nesting and so on and can certainly photograph them. Then from March 1st on, they officially begin the season. Um, the peak is in April. That's when people, not just from this area, but literally from all over the country, will show up in the alligator farm and they'll tour other places in Florida as well that are on what they call the Great Florida Birding Trail. But you'll meet people from all over during those last couple of weeks of April and maybe the first week of a May. Um, during that time, you've got, you've got some species still mating, still displaying, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, um, hatching chicks and then feeding them. So here on the right, I've just included a, fig a, fig um, a photo of a baby tricolor egret. Um, and if you've ever heard the expression, taking someone under your wings, this is where it comes from. When when mom perceives a threat to the young ones, uh, most often you'll see birds fighting in another, on a branch away or something, she'll throw up her wing and put them over them. And so you see that frequently. And in this particular case, you can see the, uh, you can see the little guy poking his head out from under the wings to see what's going on. Uh, I thought I'd just go quickly through the technical considerations. You've heard some other folks say very similar things, but uh, you really get fairly close to the birds. And if you've got a long zoom, you can get shots like the one I just showed you where you're 
you know, you're filling the frame with a, with a part of the bird, which is difficult to do in some other places. Um, I started out with a 7300 lens on an APS-C sensor. That was the full frame equivalent of about um, 100 to 450. I now use a uh, 100 to 400 on a micro four thirds sensor and that's like 200 to 800. So you can, but you can get the, get away with a 70 to 300 on an APS-C sensor and you can get some of those relatively inexpensively um, somewhere in the four to $500 neighborhood. And uh, that's, that's where I started and it's a good way to find out if you like shooting birds. Uh, you can also, use some of these super zoom cameras. I've seen people in there with, you know, these, the consumer super zoom cameras and they get decent results as well. Um, for static birds, I mostly shoot static birds. I don't shoot as, as many flying birds. I start, I've started in the last couple of years to practice it a little bit um, and I'll probably do more of it, but I, I still shoot mostly portraits. Uh, be, and I'm always looking for the light and things like that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, generally, I use manual exposures with spot meeting, metering for the best results. Uh, for flying birds, I don't use the monopod and I turn the IS off because sometimes IS, in, which is image stabilization, interacts badly when you suddenly jerk the camera or move it quickly. Uh, some of these systems have gotten better at that. You might test it with your own camera to see how you do. Uh, but for the flying ones, I'm trying to use a shutter speed of at least 1,000 and usually higher if I can get it. Apertures in all circumstances tend to be wide open. Uh, I will use fill flash for backlit situations, usually with the flash exposure compensation set to, to minus two stops. I make all my captures in raw mode. I process everything in Lightroom, um, Photoshop, and the NIC tools. NIC is a software suite that's actually now sold by DxO Mark. Uh, and I shoot in color, but I also shoot, you'll see a good many photos I will convert to black and white, and it's just based on aesthetic considerations. You know, what do I, what do, how do I think this image works best? All right, so the first couple of birds we see in the rookery on the left, you see the great egret. And before I said, I talked about birds displaying. This is a great egret displaying and he also goes through a gesture where he extends his neck all the way up. That's to attract another great white egret. So that's what we mean by we say, when we say displaying and all of these species have feathers that you see at this time of the year, like these white ones that are fanned out. That's what's called uh, mating plumage, and they only generally have it during certain seasons of the year. On the right, we see the wood stork. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that the wood stork competes with the baby, uh, with the baby pelican for <laughs> the ugliest bird I've ever seen, particularly the young wood storks. But uh, wood storks are fun to shoot when they're flying because they're so big, it's easier to catch them on the wing. Probably everybody's favorite bird because of the colors at the uh, alligator farm is the roseate spoonbill. On the left, you see a, a lovely specimen. Uh, it was... Uh, nesting uh, I and it's got a very bright plumage because of mating season and I was just very fortunate to have soft light and be able to get a good picture of a spoonbill on the right I converted it over to uh, a spoonbill to black and white and the reason I made that choice I talked about aesthetic considerations there's not a lot and I'll show you my this is about the most red there were, and then his eye was red, obviously, so we didn't get that. But the rest of this was kind of white and gray, and this um, pool that he's kind of drinking water from was just an ugly green. And so I didn't think that was, that didn't look very appealing in the final picture, 
So I thought maybe a black and white image would um, be a better choice and I liked the way this turned out. And then I got a fair amount of feedback that said it worked that way. Snowy egrets are one of my favorites there. Um, they, they get a very interesting breeding plumage and they, you can see that his head has got kind of some extra feathers and he had a little bit of a breeze behind him. So the breeze puffs up the, the feathers on his wings and the feathers on his head. Um, and the snowies don't have quite as much color as, as some of the others. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, putting him into black and white was a good choice here. Um, and this image has actually worked pretty well and has been pretty well liked. On the right, we have the tricolor that Paul said he likes to observe. They are very interesting birds. <clears throat> Again, you see the, the breeding plumage on his head. And in this case, it was a little bit backlit. So it kind of looks like he's got, you know, his hair on fire. And I thought that was what was interesting about seeing him that way. And that's why I photographed him. But this, the uh, tricolors also have those nice red eyes, which makes for uh, a good color picture uh, against their blue beaks, or at least the blue mask around their face, um, so that it, it, it's got a good color contrast. And at the alligator farm, you can get in this close. Uh, this is not a picture that I cropped a lot. It's cropped a little bit, but for the most part, that's what I got, because that's how close you can be if you've got a long enough lens. One species that I have seen less over the last few years, but still shows up is the little blue heron. Um, it also comes in in late March. And it is, <clears throat> you can distinguish it from the others. It has some of the coloration, but basically it's just blue. Uh, for those birds, you want to open up a little bit if you can. When I say open up, use a wider aperture, get a little more exposure because they tend to otherwise come out too dark. Uh, I caught this one against a clean background on a branch, so I was able to get a good photo of him. The sky isn't blown out, and you can kind of you can see the details of his feathers, and those are the kinds of things I look for. I am almost always focusing on the eyes. On the right, um, these are pr probably my favorite white bird species, the cattle egret, because they get that red color in their beaks. And they've always got a little bit of a red top, but during uh, mating season, it gets redder and it kind of spreads to the wings and so on. Uh, they're very interesting birds. <clears throat> and they're the last ones to arrive. They get there in early April and then start nesting and, and uh, laying eggs and so on uh, through a, throughout April and early May. So that's the opportunity to catch those guys. And then finally, after all of the nesting and the mating, we get the juveniles. And I always like to photograph the juveniles because they are different from, they look different from the adult birds. Uh, if you notice, on the left, you don't see a lot of these. This is a, uh, a, a night heron. It's a juvenile night heron. <clears throat> night herons don't come to the swamp much, but they do nest in other areas of the park. So occasionally you'll see individual birds in the swamp. And, in, and I've seen more juveniles than adults of this species in the swamp. And on the right, we have a juvenile um, blue heron. And what I think is very interesting about these species, and somebody showed a picture of one earlier, it might have been Jack, they start out life white, and then as they get older, they turn blue. So here we've got one that's kind of in between. He's starting to get his blue feathers, but he's still got plenty of white. And, I, and he looked right at me, both eyes. Uh, and so I got some pretty good pictures of him. Uh, some other considerations. Alligator Farm is a great place for beginners. 
because of the proximity that you have to your subjects. Uh, you know, you do things there. I was in there one time and there was a guy, he wasn't a photographer, he was just a birder. He was a guy who just liked to go and observe birds. And he turned to me and he said, this is like cheating. <laughs> and I laughed, but I, he was right. Um, and as you get better, um, or if you already have experience, the close access allows you to do an abundance of things. You can stop worrying about how, you know, whether you can catch up to a bird and start looking at the light he's in and become selective about what you're going to take. Um, I'd say the biggest difficulty at the alligator farm is trying to get clean backgrounds. The thing that I spend most of my time in post-processing is burning down bright spots in the backgrounds. So you have to be paying attention to that. But if you can do that, uh, the fact that you, you've got that flexibility to be a bit closer, you get photos that it would be difficult to say, get at any of these other locations. Um, the only downside I see is the cost, but compared to about everything but Hanna Park, it's a lot closer than most of the other locations. So if you're starting out particularly, but even if you're an experienced bird photographer, if you haven't been there, you should go uh, because it's, it's an experience. And like I said, at the end of April, when I, I said people from all over, but people from with all kinds of experience. I used to see um, professional bird photographers down there at that time of the year because they knew they could get photos that they couldn't get in other locations. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing here. Bill, one of the first questions that's in is, um, you said you prefer spot metering. What about focus points? How many? When I'm shooting portraits, I tend to go with just a very small number, usually just one. And I'll move it around the screen to, to, to adapt to the composition. Sometimes I'll just shoot and you know, use the focus point in the middle and then recompose. It depends on how quickly I think the bird's going to move and how many opportunities. Uh, when I'm tracking, then I use more focus points like nine or 12 or whatever. OK, thank you. All right, I'm going to go back to the um, to the chat room. There's a couple of things. Um, one of those, there's a couple, there's several thank yous for the presentation. So uh, let me be the first to, to not the first, but the, uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, that participated in the panel discussion today. This is all great information. Uh, and it was really nice of all of you to share your tips and tricks especially now that you're going to have competition for those different shots that you get and get so much so many accolades for um, but one of the one of the first suggestions was that if you go to the Vera uh, wetlands that Sebastian Inlet Park is about 45 minutes away and it has a lot of beautiful birds there if you want to consider if you're down that way to go ahead and head over there too while you're then while you're there uh, one of the other questions is um, from Don Dimer is, can you ride a bike? And it says Sweetland, I think that's Sweetwater, but can you can you ride a bike there? Jack? Jack? <laughs> can we lose Jack? Yes, you can ride a bike there. I'll answer that, but I have <laughs> seen people out there on bikes. There's a lot of people on bikes at uh, Vieira. Vieira, and I just saw somebody on bikes at uh, Black Point Drive, too. Well, the next question's for Jack, too. <laughs> and that is, do, they, do you walk when you're there, uh, or do you do mostly uh, ride in the car? Sweetwater Wetlands is a walkthrough. It's a walkthrough? Okay. Yes. Let me see if there's any. I think everything else is just a thank you very much for all the presentations. Uh, so if anybody has a question they would like to ask, go ahead and unmute, your, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask that at this point, please. I want to thank Katie for identifying what that bird had. I took that picture two years ago and I have studied that and I could not figure out what that uh, 
eagle was eating in that photograph. Uh, I was a long ways away and I cropped it up and I kept looking at it. And the best I could come up with was catfish. So I'm glad she uh, identified it for me. Good. Katie knows her stuff. She does. Well, at this point, it doesn't appear we have any more questions. So thank you everybody for taking time out of your uh, evening to spend some time with us tonight and, and it was a great, great presentation. I do, I do have a question. Oh, go ahead. Me, me, me. Um, Bill, you mentioned about having image stabilization off when photographing birds in flight. Um, does anybody else use that? That's the first I've ever heard that, but it, it sort of makes sense. But um, does anybody else do that? Or uh, Gene, uh, you know, Roxanne, you normally should keep image stabilization on because that whole thing is designed to give you at least two more stops of light. So for Canon and Nikon and all those things, image stabilization would normally be on. Okay. Um, but it just depends on what camera system you have. If Bill has found his own from his own experience, because he's not shooting Canon. But if you're yes. Canon and Nikon, absolutely image stabilization. Right. I well, would... Bill is shooting with the, um, with, the, with the Olympus that I'm shooting with. So I'm just curious about that. Bill, did you find it better with it off? I haven't, I haven't had that much of a chance. Interestingly enough, hmm. it, it has some dependency on the lens because I used to shoot with Canon and that, and the original 100 to 400, which is the one that I had, was a little bit quirky with image stabilization on. And I heard from a couple of other guys who were shooting with them that you might want to turn it off and hmm. crank up your shutter speed. Now that's probably not true of later lenses where Canon got better and, uh, you know, added, you know, they've gotten better at panning stabilization and so on. So with the Olympus, I'm still kind of, I just shut it off by habit, but the next couple of times I try it, I'm going to uh, turn it on because Olympus also now has a, well, and they always have had a smart stabilization that supposedly will detect the direction that you're panning in. And that's, that's part of the issue. Bill, um, when I'm there, I, I leave it on and I shoot it like a 16 hundredth of a second. And I use the continuous focus with the focus following. Um, and it seems to work pretty good with the stabilization. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, thanks. John, are you watching, uh, watching it from Ireland there at Trinity College? Um, uh, yeah, well, yes, actually, no, this is my my current office, and I've read all the books uh, through to the fifth row here. I'm working on that. Yeah, we want some of your wine, actually, that yes. you're drinking. But anyway, it gets easier to read it, the books. Uh, yeah. When you have a little vino. <laughs> yeah, guys, books thank you for fabulous presentations. They were really wonderful. Yeah, they were very yes. good. Thank you, everybody. Our pleasure. Different. Yeah. And just so you know, for uh, you can pass along for folks who were not able to join us tonight, that I will uh, post mm -hmm. the, the video of this meeting online probably in the next couple of days. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, and uh, stay warm. <laughs> See you guys. Good job, Jerry. Good. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.